Welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from U.S. Tax Reform 2.0 to the OECD's latest developments. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's U.S. International Tax Services Leader. You can watch these podcasts on YouTube at youtube.com slash Doug McConey. On this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks, we're at Westminster Studios in St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm excited to have a fully vaccinated Tom Patton on the podcast. Tom is an international tax partner specializing in inbound U.S. taxation for European multinationals and is based in PwC's London office. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Doug. Very, very happy to be here. Great to be somewhere in person with someone else. I really enjoy these in person. It's just a lot better flow for sure. So, Tom... You're originally from St. Louis. You're my, yes. actually, since we've started doing these podcasts in person, you're my second St. Louisan from out of town who's here. And you've spent time over the course of your career in our New York, D.C., and London offices. But you're back here this summer visiting relatives, yeah. and it's obviously great to catch up in person. But my first question to you before we dive into the inbound discussion is what St. Louis food were you the most excited to indulge in <laughs> when you came back? Um, I think it has to be toasted ravioli. There's there's no doubt. Okay. So toasted ravioli is one of the things that I miss. I've been a vegetarian, as you know, for, for six years. But so generally you don't find vegetarian toasted ravioli. But for those that don't understand what toasted ravioli is, what, 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 what is it? Um, well, essentially it's just breaded and deep fried ravioli. Just bread, a ravioli meat, meat filled. Yeah, usually meat filled. You can find the cheese ones. They're, they're hard, just not as good. They're hard. To, oh, I, I, I disagree <laughs> with that. They're hard to find. They're hard to find. So, and, and toasted ravioli, so a breaded deep fried ravioli is a relatively common Italian dish that you'll find here in St. Louis. Now, right. ironically, or, or maybe coincidentally, your, your wife is Italian. Yes. Like real Italian. Real like, Italian. Like yes. born there. <laughs> Italian passport holder. So what St. Louis food, on the contrary, is she the least excited about? Because we've got a big Italian presence here, and I was wondering what her, uh, her take on that is. Well, the, the first thing I should say is that I was convinced that there was a version of toasted ravioli in Italy, that you know, we've had this conversation for years, that surely there is some form of deep-fried stuffed pasta in Italy. I, I failed to find it. Okay. <laughs> so I think it truly is a St. Louis thing. All right. Um, when when she's been here, she tried for the first time spaghetti and meatballs. Um, that for the was first time? For, for the very first time. <laughs> okay. So that's not really an, a, a northern Italian, because she's from the north, right? It's not a true northern Italian dish is no. what you're breaking my heart telling me. Y you can have meatballs and you can have spaghetti. You just don't put spaghetti and meatballs together. I see. And so is that her, is that her kind of, was she a fan? It doesn't sound like um, it. I, I, I wouldn't describe her as a fan. I think she appreciated the meatballs more than the pasta. <laughs> okay. Fair, fair enough. I, I do think sometimes we, we tend to overcook our pasta yeah. here, here in St. Louis. I'm uh, more kind of well done pasta than an al dente guy, but I'm showing my, <laughs> my level of sophistication when it comes to Italian eating. But you know, I'm a St. Louis guy. Yeah, fair enough. Can't change where you're from. Right, Tom? <laughs> All right. So let's move into the real topical discussion, because maybe I would like to start a podcast at some point where we can just talk about St. Louis food, but I'm pretty certain this <laughs> listener group is not going to be that interested. But what I wanted to talk about today was inbound taxation. So foreign-based multinationals yep. that are investing in the U.S. And a number of, of salient topics to discuss, both as we think about you know, four years after the TCJA, a lot of, of provisions that significantly impacted that taxpayer base. And with some of the changes on the horizon, right? So many of our clients have a foreign parent where they've acquired, for example, a U.S. MNC with foreign subsidiaries, something mm -hmm. commonly referred to as a sandwich structure. Mm -hmm. I think we sometimes see it too where maybe you have a, a foreign parent with a, with a U.S. sub and then maybe Canada and Mexico are sometimes held right. under the U.S. And it doesn't really seem like for tax reasons that's done, but kind of a North American group with, exactly. with the U.S. parent. Right. And so we had Callum Dewar on the podcast for our, our last podcast where we really dove into the OECD's Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Mm -hmm. And focusing really on Pillar 2, the adoption of the rest of the world of a minimum tax similar to guilty. And I, I've been, been contemplating and thinking through, well, how is that going to work? And, you know, I spend most of my time focused on U.S. MNC, certainly do some, some, some inbound work. Yep. but. What happens to, to Guilty and the U.S. profile when a foreign parent starts to potentially assess tax on 
both the, the subsidiary, it's a U.S. company, as well as those foreign subsidiaries. And then I started thinking about foreign tax credits. And so, yep. so maybe if you could shed a little bit of light on kind of pillar two and how that could potentially mm-hmm. impact some of our some inbound taxpayers. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll give it a go. It's not super clear where we're going to get to at the moment. And I, but I think it's important to, to look at, you know, first the other way around. Right. So so what has the U.S. been doing in the discussions as it relates to guilty and its coexistence with other pillar two regimes? So so there's a real push, of course, from the U.S. side to get to have guilty be treated as a effectively a compliant income inclusion rule. And the effect of that is to uh, deal with intermediate holding companies between the U.S. and another jurisdiction. And, and effectively turn off any pillar two regime at that inter, intermediate holding company level. So that's sort of point number one, I think, to just bear in mind in terms of the overall discussions that, you know, the, the idea was to turn off the, the, the intermediate jurisdictions where the U.S. is the parent. I think the second thing to bear in mind is w- why are there all these discussions about guilty being a compliant regime? Well, it operates very differently than the OECD pillar two proposals. And, and simply put, or perhaps over simply put, one key difference is when you look at guilty, it's, it's an income inclusion rule with foreign tax credits. Mm-hmm. If you look at the OECD's approach, it's typically looking at having an income inclusion when there hasn't been a sufficient amount of tax be, uh, been paid on that mm-hmm. income. So sometimes you have an income inclusion, sometimes you don't. Uh, and, and guilty is all about the foreign tax credits, right? As, as you well know, oh, right? Yeah. And, and so when we look at it the other way around, all, all we've really seen is a sentence or two in, in the Biden administration's Green Book, which is the explanation of, of their proposals, that um, if a foreign parent has adopted a Pillar 2 regime and they pay tax on earnings that are also subject to the guilty rules, that foreign tax paid by the foreign parent is taken into account on under the U.S. shareholders minimum tax inclusion under guilty. And, and, and part of the issue with that is guilty doesn't really, again, doesn't really operate as a minimum tax rule per right. se. It's full inclusion with credits. So it, it's not entirely clear what that means at the moment. It, does that mean it goes into the foreign tax credit pool? Is it subject to the, all the other limitations that we have uh, you know, with, with, with regard to foreign tax credits under guilty? So, so I, you know, I have my concerns that at the end of the day, we, we have a, a relatively imperfect connection between guilty and parent pillar two, such that you might wind up paying tax under both regimes. Yeah, I, I, that totally makes sense. And it, it could disproportionately impact those taxpayers with that historic, historic the, the sandwich structure, as we discussed. The other interesting thing I think about guilty, and because we've spent some time talking with some of our colleagues outside the U.S. and and just how it differs from Pillar 2. And so you had mentioned kind of a full inclusion rule, right, with foreign tax credits. But there's obviously nuances to that calculation, as you well know. And there's our inclusion percentage, right? And so then reminding folks that, well, you know, you, you actually don't include everything. You have to go through this calculation to figure out what percentage and then how tested losses operate. And it's a complex calculation, to, right. particularly to try to describe the, for those outside the U.S. exactly how this mechanics work. And then the FTCs kind of sit on the back end of that. And then then if the income is subject to an appropriate level of tax or a, a high enough level of tax, then there's this high tax exception, right, which then can kick out guilty. And so, yeah, how we're going to square that in the context of Pillar 2 and then not disproportionately impact the foreign-based multinationals operating the U.S. from paying tax twice seems like a, a, a real issue for, for those taxpayers. Oh, without a doubt. And, and, and I think, you know, you also have to look at just the Biden proposals as it relates to, well, let, let's take that North American hub, right? Let's say that uh, you, have a, you have a European parented group with a U.S. subsidiary that holds Canada. Right. And, and they, what they've probably been experiencing uh, under under guilty after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is is not much pain holding Canada under the U.S. So they have to consider guilty, but they might very well qualify for the high tax exception. If the high tax exception goes away as part of the overall reform of, of guilty and we have increases in tax rates and we have reductions to to the deductions available to offset the income inclusions, you might find that. A scenario where you haven't been paying much tax in the U.S. under guilty since 2017, 
materially changes going forward. And then you're also layering on top of that the potential for additional tax at the parent level. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I mean that that's it's a it's a lot to chew on, particularly yeah. for for those those companies. And and I think the example where I started was the the foreign parent that acquired the U.S. MNC, and so yeah. that U.S. MNC, you know, theoretically has the experience and the expertise to be able to to understand how the foreign tax credit rules work and all those implications of a historic U.S. MNC. But then for for those companies who maybe did those foreign parented groups that didn't acquire USMNC that just have Mexico or Canada sitting under the US, you're right, they probably haven't spent a lot of time thinking about expense apportionment and right. foreign tax credit utilization. Right. It's just like they were happy when the high tax exception regulations were come out. It's like, all right, we're paying tax at, you know, twenty eight percent of Mexico and twenty six or whatever in Canada. It's high tax exception. We don't need to think about it. And you're right, the combination of those rates going up and if the high tax exception goes away. There's a lot more work to do, and they can always listen to the cross-border tax talks and <laughs> to, to try to get up to speed on some of those complex foreign tax credit issues that they're going to have to deal with. Well, there, there's also a compliance issue there, too, right, that is potentially lurking for those foreign parented groups that adopt a Pillar 2 regime. Now, clearly, the OECD has said they've been, they'd like to do this on a kind of compliance light basis. But if you look at, you know, if we consider guilty, all of that compliance is necessary to figure out all of those issues, you know, to figure out the foreign tax credit limitations and the basketing and, and expense allocation and all that. And so there is, it, it seems difficult to me for, to adopt a pillar two regime that is compliance light. And, 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 it, and I'm not suggesting that foreign parents will go the way of U.S. compliance, but there may be some, some lessons learned, I think, and some experience that can be drawn upon purely just from tracking the numbers perspective, you know, looking at the way U.S. multinationals have been right. dealing with these issues. Yeah, the compliance point is, is an interesting one. That impacts both U.S. Uh, you know, U.S. multinationals and foreign-based multinationals. But I think that those of us that do spend a lot of time in the U.S. multinational group, we're just kind of used to or calloused yeah, exactly. almost uh, <laughs> just complex compliance. And right. I think those of us that have dove in and, and read Pillar 2 and started thinking through those mechanics, it's just like, this is complicated stuff. Absolutely. Just in the application of the rules and then trying to comply. And I, I do remember that 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 line on the, the compliance light. And, you know, it, it, we know it's very hard to shortcut a lot of these complex, you know, cross border calculations. Yeah. It's just that you can't, it's hard to make a do a shortcut for them. All right. So, kind of along those lines, wanted to talk about. Uh, beat and um, some of the other provisions that have been in the TCJA that mm -hmm. significantly impacted foreign-based multinationals that are invested in the U.S. and then kind of how that lines up also with uh, with Pillar Two. So um, maybe you can just start with 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 beat and um, you know what what have companies but you know what 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 are some of the issues that have been impacting foreign-based multinationals and then we can talk a little bit about what are some things mm -hmm. that companies have done to try to manage the beat and then. How is that going to fit in with the changing landscape of Biden 2.0 and and potentially uh, pillars one and two? Sure. So so I I guess just for, to to set the scene. So beat is a is a minimum tax rule. So that what that does is it recalculates a a hypothetical tax base uh, uh, against a hypothetical tax amount and compares that to what tax you're actually paying. And that hypothetical base is is effectively your your earnings recomputed without certain related party deductions that's without regard to how much tax has been suffered on the other end it's just purely a a recomputing the the u.s tax base on uh looking at what related party payments you have yeah if you've made a related party payment you got a deduction for it you add it back to that that right. base and then you multiply it by the 10 percent and see if that tax is greater than your regular tax liability right right and and so there are a couple of threshold tests to, to get into the calculation uh, in the first place, but if you satisfy those tests, you have to do this this calculation. And w one of the key areas that has been very beneficial for taxpayers is the fact that cost of goods sold is not treated as an ad back for that purpose. Right. So, so uh, you know, a, a lot of the companies that I talk to are are looking at that from just from a perspective of are they accounting for their costs correctly? Uh, you know, have they treated things as cost of goods sold that should be treated as as cost of goods sold because the 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 impact of that um, changed significantly post B, right? Yeah, um, pre TCJA, whatever, they got a deduction for it, how they accounted for it wouldn't have been a big driver into right. how they were treating it for tax so It's purposes. a timing issue, right? And this makes it a, a, a permanent tax issue. So a lot of focus on what is cost of goods sold uh, and ensuring they're maximizing the treatment of expenses of, uh, uh, as cost of goods sold. Uh, 
other issues that have come up are typically around related party debt. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the that's caused a lot of taxpayers to look at w- um, when they're raising debt financing in the U.S. to to consider doing that through third party debt as opposed to related party debt, and that um, and that might also come off the back of of the rules in other jurisdictions in terms of of supporting. Um, supporting interest expense and supporting debt costs, and it's kind of simplified in some respects how how many taxpayers have looked at funding the U.S. of just moving towards pure third-party debt in the in the United States, as opposed to, for example, using a treasury center uh, that might be more beneficial for for a lot of foreign reasons, um, but just pushing the debt in, into the United States. Yeah, and I think for U.S. MNCs, it's typical we'll borrow in the U.S., yeah. and then you can figure out how you're going to finance through debt and equity the various foreign subsidiaries. Right. And then historically, pre-seat TCJA, I think the conventional wisdom was, well, borrow up at the foreign parent level, and then they can deploy the capital, whether through its treasury center or structural debt or whatever the, the case might be. Right. And then post-TCJA, with the introduction of BEAT, it was like, whoa, 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 those are related party interest payments. So you could throw you into the beat, which can have a number of collateral implications, which we've been in on some, which we've talked at length about on some other cross-border tax talks podcast. But what companies have just done is say, okay, if we're going to go raise capital in the market, just do it at the U.S. subsidiary and just take that related party interest payment out of the beat calculation. Exactly, and I think that's that's particularly the case when they're when they're borrowing dollars. It gets a little bit more complicated if you're not borrowing dollars externally, you know, just based on where you would as a group would look at, at at raising funds but but it it doesn't preclude doing that it just adds a little bit more complexity than they might otherwise have right and and you had mentioned the the beat you you get the 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 calculation works irrespective of how that other related party treats that yeah. particular payment so in other words it's not an under tax payment rule like we've seen as proposed in pillar 2 right and so the us um the 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 Biden administration has proposed some potential changes to this rule called the SHIELD now. So we have another fancy acronym besides the BEAT. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about that that proposal in the, the Biden Green Book and how that may move the goalposts? Yeah, and I, I think arguably this is part of Treasury's discussion with the OECD and, and trying to do as much as they can to align with what the OECD is doing just as part of the negotiations around things like, for example, guilty, right? And having guilty be tra- being treated as a compliant income inclusion rule. It's part of the wider discussions. And and if you look at SHIELD, um, well, I think the other issue as well is that BEAT has caused some consternation, if, if I could put it that way, from the perspective of not uh, um, taking into account any tax paid on the other side. So if you look at, at treaties, you know, is it consistent with the application of non-discrimination articles and treaties is a question that has been asked about BEAT um, and, and, and all sorts of other complexities, as you say, you've, you, you know, we, we've touched on before. Um, but, but SHIELD is essentially designed to deny deductions uh, to the extent the, there is not a sufficient amount of tax being paid on, you know, in the payee. Um, the the issue part of the issue with shield, of course, is then well, what does that mean, right? What, what is the sufficient amount of tax? What is an undertaxed payment for purposes of applying a, uh, um, the, the disallowance? Uh, and and that we, we just don't know, right? Um, there is a, there is a point in the green book that says, in effect, if uh, the payee is subject to a, a, another OECD pillar two regime, then that should be sufficiently taxed and therefore shield should not deny the deduction um, if however the that jurisdiction or that payee has not ad- uh, pays jurisdiction has adopted its own pillar two regime then the way we measure that is by reference to the u.s ta- uh, tax rules and um, and the u.s tax rates in terms of an appropriate amount of tax and their suggestion is that that should be 21 percent. now that's based on the green book rate of 28 Right. If you know that it obviously depends on where we ultimately get to on a corporate rate in terms of how you'd measure that bar. But the key point is, let, is that if if the OECD countries, you know, slide a bit on their time frame of adopting pillar two uh, rules and in, and um, and their own minimum tax rules, we could find a window where shield applies with a pretty high bar. Right. right? You know, in terms of the amount of tax that needs to be paid. And that's to maintain the entirety of the deduction. So this is another key difference. It's a total cliff effect, as proposed by the Biden administration. You either get to the deduction or you don't. It's not scaled based on 
you know, how much tax has been paid, you know, uh, you know, up right. to the, uh, the minimum tax amount. So, so, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it's a bit unclear as to whether Congress will be able to do something like shield, you know, kind of embark on a new rule and everything involved in writing a new rule and, you know, dealing with the issues, thinking about the issues that might come out of it and dealing with that, as opposed to trying to tinker with beat. And, right. um, and that could that's inevitably, in my mind, going to come with some pluses and probably a lot of minuses, right? right? So, yeah, one of those potential minuses is cost of goods sold, right? right? So that was explicit in the Green Book that these payments would include cost of goods sold. So you can imagine a U.S. distributor that is purchasing product from a company, and if that country, even if it's in a high tax location, has net operating losses, for example, right. and may not be paying tax because, or maybe it's even ha had historic net operating losses, maybe it's even making profit this year, but it's not paying any cash tax or a sufficient level of cash tax, then you can imagine a situation where somebody, where a, a U.S. company is purchasing goods from a high tax jurisdiction and then invokes the shield because there's not the appropriate level of cash tax, which seems to be fairly draconian, to, uh, to say the least. To, to say the least. I think there is a reference to net operating losses in the Green Book, at, at least. But clearly, you know, just, again, how you determine whether it's subject to the appropriate amount of tax is not always a straightforward issue. Um, but, but that also brings risks associated with BEAT as well. So if, if Congress decides to, to tinker with BEAT as opposed to adopting SHIELD, um, it, it, it is a possibility that they might bring in cost of goods sold as being subject to beat. So I think we've got a, a there are a lot of taxpayers out there, a lot of foreign multinationals that have probably felt post TCJA that everything has been all right, right? right? You know that the rate was lower. That you know let's say, you know let's take your example of a U.S. distributor um, where they're they're just paying a. 21% federal rate. Um, they're not subject to beat because everything is cost of goods sold. Maybe they on sell to their Canadian subsidiary to distribute in the Canadian market, and that's fine because of a high tax exception to guilty. Right. And could find themselves in a very different world going forward. All right. So let's move to 163J and really just 163 in general. Um, I am reminded that we are now in 2021. I'm, I'm still not sure how that <laughs> happened, Tom, but we're- We skipped a year to get I, to 2021. I, that, I think, but, it really yeah. feels like that, doesn't it? <laughs> and uh, and the, I, the save the DA, right? right. So the, the DA, so on the EBIT DA for, for 163J, maybe if you remind listeners kind of how 163J applies, that obviously was an impact, not just for- Foreign-based multinationals investing in the U.S., but but all U.S. MNCs, but obviously a lot of foreign-based multinationals were relatively highly leveraged, yep. and so you could argue disproportionately impacted some of those mm -hmm. those taxpayers with that with that uh, fact pattern. But remind us what is 163J and uh, kind of where are we in uh, in that journey? Sure. So so section 163 is our code section on the deductibility of interest, right? And 163J is a specific rule um, that currently limits very broadly interest expense, net interest expense to 30% of EBITDA. Um, it, it, it's, it's not defined as EBITDA in the statute. It's adjusted taxable income, but it's a good proxy for what, for what that actually means. The, the, the rules prior to 2017 only applied to thir to related party interest. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the, the the scope was significantly expanded in 2017 to just apply to all interest. And and again, I think that's that was moving a little bit more towards uh, rules we've seen in other jurisdictions in terms of limits right. on 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 interest deductibility. But as you as you say, um, uh, we are we are looking at whether the DA will continue post 2021 because the current statute changes uh, for tax years beginning after December 31st, 2021, to limit interest deductibility under 163J to 30% of EBIT. It, it, we, we don't know what's, go what, what's going to happen. I mean, at the moment, that's what the rule is. That's right. what's going to happen. And it's going to, it's going to say, that would significantly impact a lot of taxpayers. Um, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what Congress does as they're considering all the other tax provisions. I mean, on the one hand, they might you know, who knows, maybe it becomes uh, like one of those permanent extenders like we've seen in other, you know, other areas of the tax code that they just keep pushing out the, the reduction of, of the limitation from EBITDA down to EBIT. 
On the other hand, you know, if they're looking for revenue raisers, then, you know, they might just leave it as is and, and find, you know, a, 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 a lot of, a lot of taxpayers really impacted by that. Yeah. When there's obviously a cost to Congress of continuing to try to extend the, the EBITDA to, to save the DA. And you're right. The, Democrats appear to be pretty ambitious um, with respect to some of their spending priorities. So that would uh, that may may impact some of that. W- what have companies done with 160 for for 163J? Kind of as we're looking a little bit in our rearview mirror, we talked about from a beat perspective, you know, refinancing debt into the U.S. to avoid those related party payments. Looking at accounting, I and mean, what have you yeah. what have you seen in your practice um, with respect to 163J? I would say mostly it's really around. Uh, uh, if you know if if the U.S. is over leveraged from a 163J perspective, just considering reducing the debt load in yeah. the U.S. and look, you know, if it's external debt, you know, is there other debt capacity elsewhere in the in the group, you know, that that can take on that that third party debt? I think there were some questions raised along the way as to what is interest for this purpose. Mm-hmm. So, so we saw in the proposed regs under 163J pulling in things like uh, guarantee fees, for mm-hmm. example, and and swap losses and and uh, that that didn't land in the final regs. What we got was was just it only applies to what we would always think as interests, things that are otherwise deductible under Section 163, which is right. again, interests. Um, but there is a principal purpose rule to, that says, well, if you are engaging in a transaction with a principal purpose to avoid Section 163J, that it could then pull in other types of deductions again, like a guarantee fee. Yeah. So relabeling interest right. to a guarantee fee is not a good planning strategy under the, <laughs> the final regulations. Not really. Right. No. So what about the the Biden Green Book? So they talk introduce a concept in 163N, and so talk about that and how's that changed the calculus? So that that would be an additional debt cap rule, and broadly the way that would work would be to look at your proportionate earnings in the United States compared to your worldwide earnings. And this is all based on your external financial statements. And whatever, and you take that proportion times your external interest expense, again, reported on your, your externally facing financial statements. And that is the limit of how much you could deduct in the United States. Again, that would be a material, um, in, there would be a material impact of that on a number of taxpayers. For everybody. You know, well, much, basically yeah. everybody, mm-hmm. right. Right. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, we it's up to Congress as to whether or not they'll pick up that role as, you know, part of the discussions they're having where to go. Yeah, one of the other provisions in the Green Book that could potentially have a significant impact for foreign based multinationals, particularly as they're looking at acquiring U.S. MNCs, is some changes to the inversion rules mm-hmm. and specifically this concept of managed and controlled. And so this is a yeah. question we get a lot from our yeah. non-U.S. colleagues. And, you know, the U.S. is is one of, I think, two or three jurisdictions that bases, determines taxation based on place of incorporation, not necessarily where things are managed and controlled. This when I'm always talking with new associates, kind of explaining to them that that difference um, is really important just as a fundamental to, to U.S. tax. And so... Well, what is in the, the Biden Green Book with respect to inversions and how could that potentially impact particularly foreign multinationals as they're looking to acquire a U.S. group? Well, there, there, there are a few proposals in there. Um, uh, we do have, as, as many people know, uh, this our, our Section 7874, which is an anti-inversion rule. It's, a, it's extremely complicated in its application. It's been modified a number of times through regulation since, since it was enacted back, I think, in 2004. And um, a key part of that is is of that of that rule is looking at post the acquisition of a U.S. company, is there continued ownership by the shareholders of that U.S. company? And so one of the proposals is to change the threshold at which the rule might be triggered, you know, relating to uh, the continued ownership by U.S. shareholders. But there's another rule that they propose, which and that would move it just to interject from 60 percent down to 50 to 50 yeah. percent, right? So it would take the existing 60 and 80 percent rules because there's two of them in there, and and make everything a 50 percent rule. The comment that I make at that of moving it from 60 to 50 percent is that that's that's not an inversion, that's a takeover. But right. It seems to be less you know issues with that, but uh, it, that that's where they drew the line. Indeed, yeah. So so there, there's another provision that um, that they've proposed that that would apply if. Um, uh, on the acquisition of a U.S. company, if the U.S. company was more valuable than the foreign acquirer, and the foreign acquirer was managed and controlled in the United States, 
So I think there's a couple of things to can pull out from this. So as you've really started this, you know, this part of the discussion, we, we don't have a corporate residency rule. Right. Right. We, 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 and, and there isn't a corporate residency rule included in the green book. It is only within the inversion rules that they're looking at or that they've, that at least the Biden administration has proposed pulling in some kind of concept of management and control. It, it does require uh, a transaction and it does require a transaction with some specific facts for management control in the U.S. to be to be relevant for that. But I think the key takeaway here for a lot of our, you know, for non-U.S. taxpayers is that if when you hear about the U.S. proposing some form of management control rule, whether it's embedded in the inversion rules or, you know, uh, as a corporate residency rule, we don't yet know how that is defined. Right. But we've seen some proposals in the past which which aren't a rule that looks to where, you know, where does the board meet? Where does the board make decisions? But rather, where are the people who are responsible for day-to-day -day strategic decisions based? So two key, two key differences, right? They're looking at execs as opposed to the board, mm -hmm. and they're looking at where they're based as opposed to, you know, they fly somewhere and make a decision, and that's, you know, and that's the relevant jurisdiction. So I think we've got a lot of um, taxpayers out there who have, you know, part of their C-suite based in the United States that should at least, you know, monitor these developments and think about what this might mean in the context of other transactions. Yeah, and it does beg the policy question of whether a rule of that type would actually encourage, particularly if a foreign multinational is buying a U.S. group, to then take jobs out of the U.S. to try to minimize their exposure to this particular rule. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's the natural policy issue to think about. I mean, what is the impact on U.S. jobs if you put, bring in that kind of rule? And I think in part, that's why we've not seen such a rule come in in the past, right? Is that's been a, a material concern, um, you know, over the years. And, you know, we'll, we'll see if Congress continues to have that concern. All right. So so let's move on now from the from some of these proposals and and, and, and the, the Biden Green Book to a couple of other just topics that I think are relevant for for those that that are involved in or practice inbound taxation. The first where I wanted to start was the UK departing the EU. Now you have been at the center of this. You've been living in London for a number Sorry, of years. Sorry, what's this? I'm not sure I'm right. familiar with Yeah, this. and I will, for the record, <laughs> it remind you that you told me that the likelihood of the of Brexit was remote. I don't remember exactly the term, low, maybe. Callum said zero. So I, I was you know more accurate than Callum. Okay, and listen, <laughs> I've made some of my own poor political prognostication, so I'm not being critical, I just wanted to get to get on yeah. the record of that but <laughs> but brexit did happen yep. you know spoiler alert for those that 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 weren't aware <laughs> yeah. what impact has that had in all seriousness from a taxation perspective particularly for those those uh those companies that are investing in the u.s because there are a number of treaties specifically and we're kind of go down to the treaty line here yeah. um that that looked that or you know were written with the assumption that the uk was part of the eu but talk a little bit about that issue sure so so a number of our treaties with with other european countries uh, include something called the derivative benefits uh test which allows for that company to access the benefits of a treaty on the basis of being owned by a third country and 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 specifically a resident of the EU or NAFTA. So a qualifying resident uh, in the EU or NAFTA being the owner of that treaty claimant. So if you are, for example, a resident in the Netherlands uh, and you are owned by a publicly traded UK company, then pre-Brexit, you were able to rely on that derivative benefits test essentially to, to access the U.S. Netherlands treaty and access the benefits of that treaty. When, in your example, U.K. owns Netherlands, owns the U.S.? Or, or otherwise just earns income from a U.S. entity, whether it's dividends or interest or royalties, you know, a any aspect of that requires, you know, um, the benefits of the treaty Got to, to apply. Um, so what happened post-Brexit, uh, obviously the UK no longer part of the EU, that eliminated the, that Netherlands company from benefiting from the uh, derivative benefits part of the, of the treaty. It may not eliminate their benefits entirely. They may qualify for other provisions like the active trade or business test. But a key issue we typically saw was uh, 
the 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 uh, application of exemption on dividends under treaties. So that was mm -hmm. that rule in particular relied on the derivative benefits test applying and no other test applying to allow um, for exemption on dividends. So if the U.S. was held by the Netherlands, in the example that you were giving, then it would have taken us out of exemption and uh, put us into a 5% rate, typically, or uh, under the treaty. Um, so, so the other thing that we saw as a result of Brexit was, in, in the treaty context, is other strange um, uh, results like, imagine you had, you know, UK publicly traded company own a Dutch company, and that Dutch company owned another UK subsidiary. So it's all wholly owned, all in the same group, but there's just a Dutch company in between. Well, uh, and that UK company was earning income, say dividends from a, from a US subsidiary. That company um, post Brexit ceased to qualify under the derivative benefits test, because again, for the same reason that you'd have to look to was the parent resident in the EU? And the answer was no. So that um, that impacted the dividend rate in that context, and so what we what we what we did see at least in that context um, was uh, an agreement between the competent authorities that that in that it, solely for purposes of the U.S. U.K. treaty, the U.K. is treated as resident in the EU. So that allows for derivative benefits in that example. It allows for exemption on dividends in that example. It does not otherwise change, for example, the U.S.-Netherlands Treaty mm -hmm. or the U.S.-Luxembourg Treaty or the other European treaties um, where you're looking at a U.K. parented group. So it's pretty limited in its application, but but broadly I would say it's looking at where you have a non-U.K. resident company between your treaty claimant and the parent or also in the context of closely held companies. So if you have U.K. resident individuals owning a U.K. company, they got kicked out of, of exemption on dividends as a result of Brexit, and now they're back in um, on the basis of this competent authority agreement. So not su not super broad in its application, but it's, it's at least some relief. Um, sure. So let's, sticking on treaties, and maybe this is where we can end things, there are a number of treaties that have been blocked in the queue, um, treaty updates, treaty changes with from the U.S. perspective with a number of different treaty partners that have have been held up and I can you remind listeners and remind me frankly kind of where we were there was a you know I think a, a change in some hope with the prior administration when the Republicans controlled that mm -hmm. this may free up some of these treaties and I think this is very relevant we talked about this in the last podcast in the context of pillar one where you know that likely would need to come into force through changes to the treaty process where are we? What is the likelihood that we might actually see some treaties, some ratification of whether it's treaties that are in the queue or the prospects of even trying to change existing treaties to get more compliant yeah. with pillars one and two? Well, what, what we saw was, you know, a, a number of years ago, we, we had a, a key senator on the Senate Finance Committee, Senator Paul, had some objections to information sharing provisions in, in, in the draft treaties. And when he expressed those objections, uh, uh, there was a, effectively a threat of, of a filibuster. And this is a similar issue that, that you know, the Congress has faced over the years, just doing other tax legislation of, of does the party that wants to enact legislation have enough votes in the Senate to overturn a filibuster? Right, which means they've got to get to 60. They've got to get to 60, right? So, so that threat was out there in terms of, you know, being against the information sharing provisions and a threat for filibuster. And, and that, that was never, you know, that bluff was never called effectively for, for a while. Um, eventually it got to this, to, to the point where, um, uh, it was in fact, it was Senator McConnell who was also in From the great in, Commonwealth of Kentucky. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, took on the issue and, 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 and decided or determined, I should say that, they had enough votes to overturn a filibuster to ratify a number of the treaties that were out there. So the U.S.-Spain treaty, for example, mm -hmm. got ratified as well as a few others. Uh, so, um, so that did unlock the treaty process generally, at least at that time. When you have a change in the makeup of, of the Senate, you know, there is a question again as to whether that would continue, whether there is more bi bipartisan agreement on treaty policy, you know, just continuing on like we saw before. Um, not every treaty did get ratified, so the U.S.-Hungary treaty got held back right. because of concerns of of beat and whether the non-discrimination article in in that treaty should 
should effectively overturn beat and and I think those discussions are ongoing and that issue is still open at least from the perspective of there hasn't been a revised treaty you know back at the table for for, for reconsideration so so would the the current Senate ratify another income tax treaty that came up for a renewal I think I think it's possible right because um, you know, some of the underlying treaty policy is kind of a more bipartisan issue than mm-hmm. than things like, you know, how should you tax something? But that does raise some risks, I think, for something like Pillar One, right? Where much more political, or much much more political, um, and and not necessarily agreement on the underlying concepts of that. So if Pillar One, you know, needs to be enacted through through treaty, then I think there are some question marks as to whether they'll be able to get it done. Well, as those developments happen, you will hear about them on the cross-border tax talks. Tom, always a pleasure talking to you. Great getting some insights on inbound taxation. Great. Thanks for having me. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross-Border Tax Talks. Thank you, Tom Patton, an international tax partner based in London. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's international tax services leader. Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of the Cross-Border Tax Talks podcast. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.